So this video is going to be covering chapter 10, section 4, which is about changes of state as well as uh, equilibrium. All right. So first off, we're going to be discussing changes of state in terms of phases. Now, a phase is just any part of a system that is uniform. For example, if you were you know, heating up water with some poorly drawn fire, uh, this water down here would be in the liquid phase, whereas any steam that was, you know, coming off the water, this would be in the gaseous or just gas phase. Substances in nature change phase all the time. For example, if you had, let's say, a beaker full of rubbing alcohol, and I will just illustrate this a few times, but that beaker full of rubbing alcohol would be filled with liquid, which, as we remember, is molecules that are tightly packed together enough to flow. Now, this liquid would be at some temperature T, which is, again, the average kinetic energy of all of these mo molecules. However, because it's just an average, some of these molecules would have enough energy to escape and become gaseous up here, just floating around. And this is a process that's known as evaporation, which we've already covered. Likewise, once these molecules are up here, as I'll show over here, say we have some liquid and some gas. Likewise, these will be have a lot of kinetic energy, and some of them, after bouncing off walls and the cork up here and such, will have enough kinetic energy to dive back down and penetrate the liquid enough where they join the liquid. And this is a process known as condensation, in which things go from a gas to a liquid. And throughout this whole process, there are atoms that are both leaving the liquid to come be a gas, as well as gases that are using their kinetic energy to come down and join a liquid. So these two processes of evaporation and condensation are in constant flux. They're battling up and down for which one's going to have more gas and more liquid. And eventually, the system's going to reach a point where things evaporate just as fast as they condense. And at this point, we're going to have pretty much the same number of gas molecules and liquid molecules at all times. That is, you're going to have a gaseous amount that stays constant and a liquid amount that stays constant. These two are not necessarily the same. But when the processes are equal, that is what is known as the state of equilibrium, where the two opposite processes balance out. Now, because we're going to be discussing changes of state a lot in this video, I thought I'd clarify some of the vocabulary that goes along with changing between the three main states, which are solid, uh, liquid, and gas, for the most part. Now, each one of these has a way for molecules of one type to change into the other, usually by exchanging uh, heat with their environment. And each of these processes has a specific name. For example, we already covered evaporation, which is when a liquid goes to a gaseous state, as well as condensation, when gas loses energy or joins together enough to become a liquid. Similarly, a gas can go to a solid through a process called uh, deposition, or oppositely, a solid can directly become a gas, such as dry ice, through sublimation. And I'm sure you've all whole heard of solid becoming a liquid, which is just melting, as well as liquid becoming solid, which is just freezing. And these ones down here tend to be the most familiar to us. The melting and freezing, especially through daily experience with cooking or whatever, and evaporation and condensation, tend to dominate our weather patterns. 
Now we're going to be discussing a characteristic of all liquids, which is known as the equilibrium vapor pressure. And for this, we have to redraw our flask of alcohol, let's say, with a poorly drawn cork in the top. Now, if you'll remember, the alcohol has those little molecules, some of which escape, to become gas that is floating up here. And the equilibrium vapor pressure is essentially the measure of the pressure that this gas exerts on the wall around it. Now the vapor pressure is based on a few variables, the first of which is the temperature. Because if you raise the temperature, you're going to have more and more molecules that have a velocity sufficient enough for them to escape and join the gas molecules up here. Now when you have more gas molecules up here, they're going to be banging against the side of the container more often and thus exerting more force per area because over the same amount of area there's going to be more molecules hitting thus exerting more force. The second thing that vapor pressure depends on is the intermolecular forces of the actual liquid contained right here because if there are high intermolecular forces like let's say in a molten ionic compound where each one of these molecules has a positive and negative charge and they're sort of held together in an orderly arrangement it's going to be very hard for one of them to gain enough energy to overcome these charges and escape so you're only going to have you know a few molecules up here versus in say alcohol which evaporates very readily because it's only held together by London dispersion forces, you're going to get a lot of molecules that are over, able to overcome the very weak uh, intermolecular forces within the alcohol and you know come into the gaseous state up here. And this is why alcohol and ether and other such compounds are what are known as volatile compounds. Now that just means that they evaporate very readily, whereas ionic compounds, like this one right here, have strong intermolecular forces and don't evaporate nearly as readily or as easily as the volatile compounds do over there on the right. So now we're going to be discussing boiling. And boiling, if you'll remember, or just from experience, is when a liquid gets hot enough to the point where gas and vapor uh, start forming bubbles within the liquid not just you know sort of steaming up from the surface. And this happens at a materials boiling point and the technical explanation for a boiling point is the point at which the uh, vapor pressure that is the pressure of these molecules above you know pushing every which way is equal to the atmospheric pressure. That is the pressure of the atmosphere pushing down onto the liquid. Now at the boiling point, the temperature of the liquid will actually remain constant. And this is because all of the added energy from the heat of the flame is going into molecules that are then escaping. So the remaining molecules they're stuck here in the liquid only have just enough energy to keep them bonded here and any extra energy will send them flying off as vapor. However, you can change this temperature uh, that the boiling point at which the boiling point occurs by changing the pressure above the uh, liquid. And this is because, if you'll remember, the boiling point is simply when the vaporization pressure equals the atmospheric pressure. So if you lower the atmospheric pressure, then the vaporization pressure can also be lower and that will allow things to boil away easier. For example, if you have, let's say, milk in a container and you lower the pressure above the milk to the point where water can spontaneously leave at 
room temperature, then what you're left with is all the water uh, vaporizes, that is it just leaves the milk, and you're left with the fine powder at the bottom, which is what we know as which is what we know as condensed milk. And a similar process is used to refine sugar. And the reason they do this is so that they can dehydrate the products without actually uh, burning the dry end product they're looking for. And this relationship can be described very generally as a correspondence between temperature and pressure. As you decrease the pressure, that is the atmospheric pressure above a liquid then its boiling point will also lower. Likewise if you were to raise the pressure then it would take a lot more heat to reach the boiling point and that's the idea behind say a pressure cooker. Now we're going to be discussing discussing uh, boiling and its relationship with energy. So let's say you had a pot of water and it was boiling, there was plenty of steam coming off, there were bubbles rapidly forming within the liquid. If you were to remove it from the stove, you would find that immediately you would just have water, albeit at 100 degrees Celsius, its boiling temperature, but it would not still be boiling. And this is because all the extra energy you're adding through this stove, let's say, is being used to overcome the intermolecular forces between the atoms and allow them, or molecules rather, and allow them to escape. The energy added is not being used to increase the kinetic energy of the molecules. Rather, it's being used to uh, transform some of the potential energy binding these molecules together into kinetic energy out of the liquid. Now, it turns out this added heat that we use to transform uh, a liquid into a gas at its boiling point is sort of a constant number and this constant number is represented by change in heat with respect to velocity and it's known as the molar enthalpy of vaporization. Now that's pretty complex and basically what it means is molar, it's the amount of energy required to vaporize one mole of liquid once, once the liquid's already at the boiling point. So for water, the molar enthalpy of vaporization is very high because there's a lot of potential energy stored within water molecules that tend to be very polarized. So there's a lot of this hydrogen bonding that goes on between different water molecules. So you have to input a lot of energy for each mole in order to overcome this potential energy from the extensive hydrogen bonding.